Thanks, Barry. Um, and I suppose just to uh, amend that slightly, it will also be preceded by a bit of an introduction because the topic kind of has a backstory. So um, I'm Ziona Strowitz, and what I do is research on people's use of built settings. So I do briefing, uh, strategy, and evaluation. I've got a long repertoire of systematic research, and it is both at the uh, granular scale of what happens inside buildings and at the scale of what happens uh, with architecture and urban settings. So, um, I've got a bit of a backstory with uh, tall buildings. In 1998-99, I was asked to lead the consultation with Londoners uh, for LPAC's kind of swan song on tall building policy. And it was extremely interesting. We did interviews with residents in a tower block in Bow, in Hyde Park, at Archway, um, and with heritage design and developer constituencies. And I must say that I came away with a conclusion that people were quite excited with tall buildings, uh, especially if they lived in them, of course. Um, but we picked up a lot of interest in tall buildings being a, a net contributor and very, very little resistance, anxiety, aversion. In fact, the advice was quite conservative. For anyone who was around at the time, the client who was Robin Clement died in the uh, course of the job and it sort of left the pulling together of it uh, a little bit floundering in my view. So the next involvement I had was via the BCO, the British Council for Offices, where I did a, a research study with occupiers of tall buildings. And this was 2002. It was just at the stage where a lot of organizations were committed to taking big space in Canary Wharf, the kind of floor plates in tall buildings that they couldn't achieve in the city. And there was a holding uh, one's breath moment whilst people wondered if what had happened at the uh, Twin Towers on 9-11 would dent people's confidence. Um, in fact, the view was that it will be rapidly lost in the mists of time. And so the next thing I found myself doing was being the editor and a um, chapter writer on the BCO's Tall Buildings a Strategic Design Guide, and this came out in 2004, and it went into various print runs, and it has just been issued as a revised, totally revised edition. But the view in this uh, publication was very optimistic, and I must say it is something that I shared, this great sense of optimism about buildings that were then at the design stage, like the Shard, like the Leadenhall building, etc., and so, about two years ago or so, when New London Architecture ran an event called London's Growing Up, and I was asked to lead off on a panel as to uh, what I thought about the evolution of tall buildings now that they'd been realized in London, um, as the editor of this guide, I said that, frankly, I'd felt a bit oversold. I thought that I had taken an un uh, a view that was more optimistic than reality warranted. And so when I was um, asked to contribute to this, I looked back on all of my subsequent contributions on the tall building story. This was in Beijing. Uh, this one's gone a bit wobbly on here, but um, this was at a Hong Kong uh, international conference on tall buildings, and still I was taking the view that tall buildings made a very significant contribution to, sustain, to sustainable urbanization. I called it less take, more give. And I'm sure that Chris Twin will talk more about that later. And so when I was, com when I was uh, coming round to write the piece on here, which is, you know, so what do I think now? I did feel very mixed about it. And some of the um, sort of particular mixed feelings 
on my part, is very personal, do surround the shard. I remember being terribly excited about its offer of ethereality. I think that in, you know, it strikes me as a very uh, opaque building and um, with a very, very uh, clunky base, the way it hits the ground. And I'm very, very conscious that there's practically no part of London that I can approach from, and most particularly coming down Kingsland Road and or um, uh, coming down from Highgate, that this building is always in my vista. I have a bit of a problem with that. Um, this building, which um, uh, you can guess the one I'm going to be talking about, it's the one on the left, uh, there I am leading a group of people from Helsinki. In fact, we had just been to the GLA where uh, Colin and his colleagues had given them a wonderful presentation. And I found myself having to explain this as a kind of aberration. And, um, you know, I didn't get it either, but fortunately I'm not the only person who doesn't, so I feel in a good peer group company. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that carbuncle cups are... Uh, a good or a bad thing, but in general, I think that our industry does need to be much more openly self-critical and not only be fearful of uh, criticism. And one of the things that I feel about this building is the quid pro quo that it offers, and I accept that there is a real opportunity that you can go to the top for free. Um, I'm not sure that it's worth the sort of very uh, mundane and rather soulless <coughs> queuing and security palaver, etc., that I photographed uh, when I visited the building. And if I were to choose my personal worst, I suppose it would be this in, um, uh, in Shoreditch. I find it extremely disconcerting. Uh, you can never tell from the outside what floor level you're looking at. Everything is uh, very, very surreal, and uh, I find it um, very aggressive, actually. So I have got quite a few disappointments that contradict the opt or balance the optimism that I developed in those books. Um, I just wanted to say that I don't think that these issues are unique to London. I was in Montreal in June and standing on Montréal and looking down, I thought, well, at least London's doing better than this. This looks very, very uh, hit and miss and unclustered and the actual quality of the individual buildings is so wanting in my view and so uh, lacking in synergy that I thought, well, we're not that bad after all. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was in New York and riding into Manhattan from Kennedy Airport, I saw this. And I just, you know, it was very conspicuous from uh, quite far out uh, of Manhattan. I was completely perplexed. And so I Googled the pencil building. And indeed, it is called the pencil building. And who here who doesn't know can guess the architecture of the pencil building. Any offers? Well, it is the same architect who designed the walkie-talkie. And um, it is so out of kilter with anything surrounding. Uh, I went to design school in New York, and this view down Park Avenue was always one of my favorite, the way the vista closed and framed by what was then Pan Am and became MetLife. And that's changed, and of course there's no view you can have. You know, the pencil building is inescapably everywhere. And if we think that we're particularly touchy in London about skyline policy and that no one else cares, that's not true. Uh, New Yorkers are very, very unhappy about it. So, have I now totally changed my mind about tall buildings? The answer is no. I feel very uh, excited uh, very about uh, the Leadenhall building. Again, it's personal. I've led the strategy for the uses at the base of the building. The whole ground plane, which is a six-story volume, is open space, and I led the research on what the public uses should be. And 
I've also worked on this project, the White Collar Factory, and the tower is tall in the Shoreditch context. It's 16 stories, and it's actually fully built out now, and at the top there's going to be a garden, and the running track's already there, and I think it works absolutely brilliantly there. So, uh, the jury's open. I think it does depend on design quality, and the real issue is how do you arbitrate on what design quality is.